Okay, welcome to the Earning Freedom and Success After Prison podcast. This is a recording number two with my friend Kenyatta Lial. Kenyatta Lial is a true inspiration and what I really describe as the epitome of a mastermind. Why? Because he has faced struggle, the struggle of a lifetime, a life, a pr life prison sentence. But instead of allowing that life prison sentence to derail his sense of dignity and meaning, he took the path of Nelson Mandela, Viktor Frankl, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, so many other people who have faced struggle but come back stronger than when they went in. In the first episode of this series, Kenyatta told us a little bit about how he had a mindset. He was inspired by a book. I think it was, was it Ken Allen Kenyatta? It was James Allen. James Allen, As a Man Thinketh, I will be linking to that in our show notes. But today we are going to hear a little bit more about the specifics that, that Kenyatta did, the specific accomplishments that he achieved while he was serving a life sentence in prison. And we're going to learn about how his adjustment through prison resulted in, in his achieving an extraordinary level of success since he returned to society. So Kenyatta, thank you so much for coming back to uh, the Earning Freedom Success After Prison, prison podcast so we could share your inspiring story with other individuals who are serving lengthy sentences in prison. Now, in the last episode, you were telling us about how you reject, you started to reject the, the mindset of the penitentiary and separate yourself from people who are still in, engaged in the criminal lifestyle. I would like you to help us understand a little bit about the specific courses that you took that, that had an impact on your life as you were going through these decades in prison. Well, thanks for having me back, first of all. And uh, I think when we talk about specific programs, uh, there's there's several that come to mind. And I think the first one that comes to mind is called um, Victim Offender Education Group. Uh, this, this program is run by the Insight Prison Project um, based up in Marin County here in California. And uh, the program is really was really instrumental in helping me understand you know, how I went from a little kid who was uh, hurt by his father being gone to an out of control adult that was running around um, committing robberies and um, getting caught with a firearm. Um, you know, and there's a, there's a big gap in between there. And so what I what I understood and what I learned from the program is that, you know, I had, I had trauma, you know, as a child, you know, unresolved trauma. You know, my father leaving my, my brothers and my mother, that was a traumatic experience. And so, you know, it was through that experience, you know, as a young person, I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know how to process that trauma. And, you know, the, the pain that I was feeling, you know, it came out uh, in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that I learned was, you know, the process of how that happened to me. You know, the Vogue program helped me go back. It took me back and I sat in a, in a cohort with 15 other guys for 81 months. You know, and this isn't like a couple of weeks, but 81 months we went through this process um, to learn about ourselves. And, you know, I had to go back to the very beginning and really look at my childhood and understand how this, this uh, unresolved trauma had impacted my adult life as, you know, and, and it was, it was a really, really insightful, um, process and I was so grateful to be part of it, but um, that's one program, and that's one one thing that really helped me. Another thing that I did was uh, get involved um, with uh, you know pursuing my educational um, uh, pursuits. Uh, it was it was uh, the Prison University Project, um, the PUP program at San Quentin that I got involved in. Um, I like I told you before, I got my GED. Um, when I was at Susanville, and then once I once I landed at San Quentin, they had well, a program. You were at Ironwood also before. So, which which of the prisons? Tell us about your prison journey on the life sentence. Where did you start, and where did you transition to? Well, I started at at R.J. Donovan, uh, and that was in San Diego. That was in 1995. I was sentenced, and once I got um, sent to the California prison system, I landed at the reception center R.J. Donovan in San Diego because that's where I'm from. I came out of San Diego County. I went to the closest reception center, R.J. Donovan. From there, I spent about probably about five months there, and then I went from there to um, to Ironwood, which is a level three prison out in um, out uh, uh, in the eastern uh, part of Southern California near the Arizona border. 
Um, it's in Blythe, California. So I, I got sent out there and, um, you know, with a fresh life sentence, 25 years old. And uh, I really got some trouble there. And I got sent up to Pelican Bay State Prison. And, um, yeah, so from Pelican Bay, I went to Sentinella. And from Sentinella, I went to San Quentin. So I so bounced just around. A second. We, we're using Google Hangout to record this podcast. And there was just a little bit of an audio delay. If I Correct me if I'm wrong, but did you say you started off at Donovan, then you went to Ironwood, then you went to Pelican Bay, then you went to San Quentin. Is that right? No, then I went to Sentinella, and then I went to San Quentin. Okay, and in those different institutions, can you tell us a little bit about what you're focusing on educating your mind, you're focused on introspecting, you're focused on separating yourself from people who still want to be a part of the prison culture. What? How do the other people in prison, how are they responding to this new Kenyatta, this more enlightened Kenyatta that wants to go back and reflect on his childhood and the influences of his life, how is how are the rest of the men and the and the population responding to your change? Well, there were certain people that you know that didn't understand it, and so you know, obviously, they looked at me like I was weird or I was doing something different, like I was, you know, um, an outcast or something. But uh, there were other people, a large number of people, especially at San Quentin, that understood what I was going through and supported me in that change. Um, San Quentin is a, is a really unique place. Um, there are a lot of programs there uh, to help people change their lives. And so I got the kind of support that I needed um, from other men who were facing, you know, longer sentences than me that were doing the same exact work. I got a lot of support from them as well. So um, there were some people that were going to hate, that were going to, you know, point the finger. Oh, yeah, Kenyatta's tripping. He's, you know, um, you know, he's, he's, he's doing whatever. But um, there are other people that were really supportive in, in that process of change. So you, you've, you've mentioned a couple of times that was the case at San Quentin. How did you find the level of support in institutions like Ironwood, Pelican Bay, Sentinella? Well, let me, let me put things into perspective. Um, when, I was at, when I was at Ironwood, I wasn't even thinking about change. Okay, I mean, I was you know, still caught up, still hanging out in the yard with the fellas and, and you know, doing all the crazy stuff. You know, when I got sent from there up to Pelican Bay, that's when I started to think about change. I started to think about it, you know? Then I got I got transferred to Sentinella and that's when I started acting on the change. I really started, you know, pursuing it. I started reaching out for help in a really significant way. And that's um, and really then, important because a lot of the people who are listening to this, this podcast or watching this video, they may feel some pressure. Like one of the things that I used to hear when I was in prison is as I was teaching, I'd, I, I'd listen to a guy who says, I'm going to change when I get out. Well, I'm in here. I'm going to live as I have to live in prison. And I heard that message so many times and it always, you know, really uh, struck me as being so disconnected from what it really takes to begin moving the needle and changing our life like you eventually did. What what advice or guidance might you offer to someone who is sitting in a, in a prison someplace listening to this story who is feeling that he's not quite ready to change? Do you do you have some thought some thoughts or some guidance on when an individual should begin making these changes on on improving his mind and improving his uh, outlook and attitude? Uh, absolutely. Uh, change isn't easy, but it's definitely necessary. And if you want to make a difference in your life, you have to start now. You can't wait till you get out. If you wait till you get out, it's too late. You know, and so anybody that's going to uh, try to try to use that formula, it's not going to work. It's well, you had work. some direct, some some enormous influences that came into your life as a consequence of the decisions as, as of your adjustment. Once you once you separated yourself from the population as far as you know the, the, the prison mindset and started focusing on how Kenyatta is going to come back to society successfully, more people started to invest in you. And I know the story of Chris Redlitz, and I, and I know you're going to talk with us about the, last, the impressive program called The Last Mile and had that, how that opened opportunities for you to come back to society with an extraordinary career waiting for you. Um, how, tell those, those in our audience how a prison adjustment relates directly to the opportunities that are going to open both while in prison and upon release. 
Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I mean, once I went through the Inside Prison Project Vogue program, I got involved in the college program. Both of these things really opened up my mind and really helped me build confidence and self-efficacy and what I could do once I got out. Um, and by the time uh, I met Chris and Beverly in 2010, I was already well on my way to making the necessary changes I needed to make in my life. Um, when I met them, it was really unique because I always had this entrepreneurial spirit. I just used it in a negative way. And so when I was approached by them. Well, wait a to, minute, because some of our audience, they're not going to know Chris and Beverly. We've had Chris Redless okay. on the show once, but that was dozens of episodes ago. Tell us how you first met Chris and what you learned about the program and then how you distinguished yourself in such a way that Chris wanted to really embrace you and mentor you and, and help prepare you for the success that you're enjoying right now. Okay. Well, in 2010, I just graduated from college, from the college program. And at that point, that was the, at the highest thing that you could do inside prison was to, you know, to graduate from college. And so after I'd done that, I was searching for the next thing that could help me expand my horizons and really, you know, give me a leg up once I got out of prison. Um, and at that time, I was I was fortunate enough to meet it through through one of my other mentors in there. I met a guy named Chris Redlitz, and Chris had come to San Quentin to do um, a talk about business and entrepreneurship with us. And um, I guess once he got there, he was you know just focused on doing about a half hour talk and then just taking off. You know, he thought I was just going to be in and out. But once he came in. He found a group of men that were really engaged, really focused, and really, really, um, really eager to learn about what he had to offer. And so he ended up staying at San Quentin that day for about two or three hours. And, you know, we were asking all kinds of really insightful questions. And, you know, when he left the prison that day, he was really, really impressed about what he saw. And Chris at the time was running an accelerator on the outside called Kick Labs. Uh, tech accelerator where he was taking young startups and, you know, investing in them and helping them grow. Um, he thought, wow, wouldn't that be a great idea if we could start a tech accelerator inside San Quentin? So he and his wife, Beverly, they came back to San Quentin and, and wanted to um, find a group of men that they could build the program around. You know, and I was fortunate enough to be one of those people. And so when they contacted me about being part of the program, um, the, which they named the last mile, I was you know, all in, because like I said, I always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I just used it in the wrong way. I wanted to learn more about business and entrepreneurship because I knew that I wanted to go in that direction once I got out of prison. So I saw this as a great opportunity for me to learn the things that I really needed to learn about entrepreneurship and business. And so I connected with Chris and Beverly. Um, we picked five other guys to start the program with us and we built the curriculum that was really, 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 really uh, powerful. Uh, what made it, it powerful? Well, it, it taught us a lot of things about, first of all, about entrepreneurship. I mean, so many of us think we know what entrepreneurship is and what it's about. Um, and, it, and, and instinctively we do because there are a lot of, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we did in the street that are parallels to what, um, you know, real entrepreneurs do with legitimate businesses. There's hustle involved. There's determination involved. There's grit. There's grinding it out. You know what I mean? And it's that kind of stuff that really um, helps you in the real business world. And so I walked into it with some of those tools in place already. Um, what Chris and Beverly did is, is taught me how to harness that hustle and transform it in a way that was going to be positive. And so uh, the program consists of three pieces. And the first piece is um, really getting us involved in social media. So the last mile allowed us to write tweets and get on Twitter, um, uh, uh, write blog posts so that our voices could be heard. And so that we could be really transparent with the outside world so they could learn more about us and uh, as people, not just convicts or prisoners or, or inmates, but as Kenyatta. They could learn about who I am, what I've been through in my life, and more importantly, what I'm going to do right now, what what you know, what I wanted to do once I got out. And so they're able to see the progress that we're making inside. And that was really, really powerful. The second piece was figuring out what we're passionate about and taking that passion uh, to solve a problem um, in the form of a business. And so um, they taught each and every one of us to, 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 to um, 
to narrow down exactly what we're passionate about, take that passion and figure out a problem that we could solve with that passion in the form of a business. And so we came up with these business formal, uh, we came up with these business ideas and then developed formal business plans and then learned how to pitch the ideas um, uh, in a five minute uh, presentation that we did at the, as the culmination of our program um, at our demo day. And uh, so, and then the third piece is once you get out, you're, uh, if you graduate from the program, once you get out, um, they'll find you um, an internship at a tech company. And so I went through the program and, um, you know, in 2012, I graduated from the last mile. My demo day was uh, in, in May of 2012. And uh, it was through that process that I met a guy named Duncan Logan, who's the founder and CEO of a company called Rocket Space. And Duncan is a good friend of Chris's. Chris brought Duncan in to be a mentor for myself and the other men of the program and um, help us with our business plans, um, share with us his insights about business and entrepreneurship, the things he was going through and had gone through and that he had seen, you know, um, uh, in, in, his, in his years in business. And uh, he was really, really impactful for us. Um, after my demo day, Duncan offered me an internship at Rocket Space. And at the time I was serving a life sentence. Can you imagine sitting in a prison with a life sentence and having a business person, a successful business person, come into the prison and offer you a job? That's basically what he did for me. And so a year later, um, Prop 36 was passed. Well, before and- you get into getting out of prison, let me okay. let's let's just let's just crystallize what happened here. Because a lot of people in our audience might say you were lucky. You met Chris Redlitz and you met Beverly and Chris Redlitz is a very successful business guy and then you meet Duncan Logan, a CEO of a company and just things fell into place for you. I want to put into perspective here for our audience. Now, Kenyatta didn't just meet Chris Redlitz and Duncan Logan. In fact, that he said that that happened in 2010. I want to ask you to just give us a quick reminder, Kenyatta, when did you go into prison on this sentence? I went in in uh, 1994. 1994. And he said that he served the first five years just kind of floating along in prison. And then it was after those five years that he started to work on himself. So he started working on himself in 1998, 1999. You had 10, 11 years to really develop your mind, your attitude. He had... He had done a lot of introspection. He'd gone back and done a lot of work on himself and figured out what were the influences that led him into criminal behavior? What were the influences that led him to choose the types of friends that he had? And then he went for, forward and achieved some formal education, earning a college degree, which he described as the highest level of credential an individual could get in prison. But I got news for you. It's also the highest level of educational credential that people get on this side of the fences. And it was because Kenyatta made that investment in himself that caused Chris Redlitz to be, hey, impressed with this guy. So Kenyatta has had a, an extraordinarily in, influential role in actual prison reform movement. Why? Because Chris Redlitz, a powerful player out here in California and in in the world of technology, never even thought about prison reform or prison education. It wasn't until he sat face to face with a guy who's serving a life sentence and says, wow, maybe I can make a difference. So what's really important for those of you who are in prison right now is to really connect the dots because it sounds so easy. And wow, he's lucky. And I've heard this so many times Oh, you know, that's never going to happen to me. It will never happen to you unless you take the initiative that Kenyatta is describing, unless you can find the drive, the passion, the energy to reject the criminal lifestyle, focus on developing yourself, focus on looking back, focus on following the path of Nelson Mandela, Viktor Frankl, Socrates, all of the other masterminds we've presented on here so that you can recognize there is a relationship, there is a reason that Chris Redlitz and Beverly Parenti and The Last Mile got started. And there is a reason that Duncan Logan, the CEO of a company, came in there 
and was so impressed with Kenyatta. And there is a reason that Kenyatta was in such a phenomenal position to seize the moment when this proposition that he's going to be talking about came to action. Had he not sown those seeds in the beginning, my guess is that none of that would have happened. Now, now, Kenyatta, can you elaborate? Am I accurate on that, or were you just lucky? No, it's spot on. You are spot on with what you just said. And, and, and you know, it's funny because people always say, or I've heard it a number of times, you know, Kenyatta, you're an exception. You got lucky. Well, let me tell you, I wasn't no exception, and I wasn't lucky 25 years ago when I was sitting in the courtroom and the judge gave me a life sentence. You know, so if I wasn't an exception then, I can't, you know, there's no way that I could be an exception now. The bottom line is, is with hard work and a positive attitude and some focus, you can achieve just about anything in life, you know, and, and I didn't read this on, you know, in People Magazine, and I didn't see it on Oprah Winfrey. Man, I'm living proof. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. You guys that are sitting there listening to this, you men and women out there that are, are working hard to change your life, believe it. You know, I've walked those yards, I've ate those top ramen soups and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I'm just like you, you know, the difference between somebody who's successful and who's not, not so successful is simple. It's the choices that we make. And if you make a choice to invest in your life right now and you commit to moving forward and doing the right thing, I guarantee you that good things are going to happen. And you don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, when Kenyatta started, when he decided to put down a knife and pick up a book, he had no idea how long he was going to serve, how long it would be before he would get a college degree, how long it would be before he would meet an influential person like Chris Redlitz. But the point is, the salient point is, is that he worked really hard for many, many years before that opportunity opened. He worked hard to position himself, and then when the law changed, he was at the top of the list. Tell us about how that law changed. We've got about eight more minutes, and I'd love for you to tell us what, how the law changed, how many more people came into your life advocating on your behalf, and how a judge who once thought that you should never get out of prison opened the door and allowed you to come back. Could you share, us, share with us that experience, Kenyatta? Yeah, so in, in 2012, um, Prop 36, which was a measure that was written by um, the uh, um, uh, the uh, the Three Strikes Project at Stanford, they wrote it. They partnered with um, a number of different uh, law enforcement agencies, and they got it on the on the 2012 ballot, and it passed. And basically, what it did was amend the Three Strikes Law so that it takes a violent or serious felony to be struck out. And I was incarcerated on a nonviolent, non-serious felony. And so um, I was eligible to be resentenced. Um, I, I was introduced to um, um, the Stanford Three Strikes Project people uh, who actually took on my case. Chris and Beverly played a role in helping me get um, their representation. Did you get um, Mike Romano? Mike Romano, yes. Mike Romano, Emily Galvin, um, they all uh, got on board with my case and they helped present my case to the judge who sentenced me to 25 to life. And, you know, at the time, you know, they, there was no guarantee that just because the law passed and, and, and you fit the description of, of getting relief, you still have to apply for relief. And so, and you have to prove to the judge that you're not going to be a danger to society. And here was the, here was the thing for me is that all of the work that I had done in prison, Every single certificate that I had gotten, every single chrono that I had gotten, you know, all of this stuff was presented to the judge and the judge looked at it in its totality. And you know what he said? He said, you know, 25 years ago or, you know, back when I sentenced you, um, I believe that you deserve 25 to life. But looking at everything that you've done, I believe that you deserve another chance. And so it was based on that work that I had done that he felt that I was prepared to be successful once I got out. And it was through that work and this representation that I was given a second chance by the judge. And, um, you know, it, about two weeks after I got out, I started working at Rocket Space as an intern. Tell us about Rocket Space, first of all, because I want to make clear here that Kenyatta didn't go to a job that had no future. And I'm not, every job has a future because every job is a, an opportunity to prove yourself in advance 
But because of the adjustment that Kenyatta made while he was incarcerated, you're sitting here listening to him. And in you're listening to Kenyatta, you're listening to a man who is extremely articulate, who is, who is confident, who can bring value into any environment. And I can tell you, because when, when I was teaching at San Francisco State, Kenyatta would come into my room and he would have the students mesmerized for a three-hour class because of the preparations he made in prison. He can bring value into any environment. You can hear it in his voice. You don't have to take my word for it. You can hear it in his voice. But rocket space is not the type of entry-level job that awaits most guys who go through struggle. He positioned himself for real success. What is Rocket Space, Kenyatta? Rocket Space is a technology campus uh, for tech startups. Basically, we're like a hotel for tech startups. Startups move in, and we take care of all their needs so that they can focus on building their company. And when I when I came to Rocket Space, I you know I didn't come with some computer science degree and you know, a whole bunch of, uh, you know, experience in business. What I did come with was uh, a really strong work ethic and a determination and will to do whatever it took to add value to the company. And so before I even got there, in my mind, my mind was already made up that I was going to do whatever it took. If I had to dump trash and make coffee every single day and scrape gum off the floor, I was going to be the best trash dumping, coffee making, gum scraping person that there ever was. And I was going to come in early. I was going to leave late. I was going to work weekends. I was going to do whatever it took. And that's exactly what I did. I came in and I did that. I started as an intern. And um, within within two years time, I've been able to work my way up into a management position. And now I'm in a position where I can hire people. And I've hired two formerly incarcerated people um, who are uh, last mile graduates also. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's been an awesome experience. And right now I'm living the dream. And I can guarantee you that if you guys that are listening to this, focus and commit yourself to the process. Remember, believe in the process that these things can happen for you as well. That is just such an inspiring story. But I can guarantee you one thing. Kenyatta may have come from the prison compound, but he is not going to be some guy who is deluded by happy talk about some guy who just says, give me a job. He said he's hired two people, and I suspect that those two people have prepared themselves as well as Kenyatta. He is the type of guy that will see through the BS that comes out of prison so easily. He's looking for a guy like, if you're if you're interested in successful success, if you're interested in walking, Julie, the, walking the it, that's the, the way that he makes it that he makes it work. Are the, the two guys that you hired, Kenyatta, what type of background do they have? Both of the guys that I hired, Floyd Hall and, and Caleb Hunter, um, are, are graduates of the last mile. They had committed different crimes and wound up in prison too, but they found themselves on the same path of transformation, and they did the work, and they found themselves in a position where they um, could be in the last mile program, mm -hmm. And it was through their hard work and dedication that they wound up at Rocket Space as well. And so both of those guys are doing great. Both of them are Floyd is in, in school um, working to get his real estate license. Caleb actually has moved on to work with IBM and their innovation uh, center there. And so both of those guys are doing great. Not just those guys, but other uh, members of the last mile. Every, every single one of us are, are, uh, are doing well out here now. Well, I know that The Last Mile is an extraordinary program. It has really gotten national attention. It is an innovator in, in prison reform um, with regard to education and reentry programs. And although you may be in an institution without The Last Mile there, I can tell you what we can do with the Earning Freedom Program and Success After Prison Program is we are going to get, I'm going to ask Kenyatta to connect me to, to his two colleagues and others who've graduated. And we're going to try to bring The Last Mile into you. Because there's no reason, if you're in prison right now, that you too can't be developing this skill set so that you can become articulate, learn how to, to uh, describe your ideas, develop your ideas, refine your hustle so that you become successful. That's what this program is about. I'm so grateful to you, Kenyatta, for sharing this inspiring story with our audience. Um, as we come to the close, do you have any final words that you might want to share with people who are still in the struggle? Uh-oh, it looks like we've lost audio here with Kenyatta. All right, that's the problem with technology. We'll be back again with other inspiring guests. I am Michael Santos with Earning Freedom and Success After Prison, and I look forward to sharing another inspiring story tomorrow. Thanks so much.